Hi, I'm Jack Cush, Executive Editor of RoomNow.com, and welcome to Therapeutic Update. Today we're going to review the proceedings of a recent Arthritis Advisory Committee hearing that the FDA had on August the 3rd, wherein they considered the use of tofacitinib in psoriatic arthritis. Today we're lucky to have Dr. Philip Meese, who is one of the participants in the meeting. Um, it, and you should know that he actually led off the meeting with a great, uh, really fabulous review of the unmet need uh, in psoriatic arthritis as far as therapeutics and what the therapeutic landscape was like. So we've asked Philip to come here and talk to us about his impressions on the meeting. Philip, welcome. Thank you, Jack. Okay, so we're gonna get into five questions. The first question is, it was a near unanimous decision by the panel, 10 to one, in favor of the efficacy and safety and the uh, approval of tofacitinib and psoriatic arthritis. What was your impression of the, the whole day overall? So I think that uh, the uh, uh, committee heard uh, a very thorough review of the clinical data, both efficacy and safety for the use of tofacitinib and psoriatic arthritis. This was based on two phase three uh, uh, regulatory studies in uh, one in a, a bio-naive population, uh, which is known as opal broaden, uh, and the other uh, uh, in a uh, uh, biologic uh, experience population, which is known as opal beyond. Both studies showed efficacy in the primary in, uh, endpoints of the study, which were ACR20 response uh, and HAC or function response uh, in both the five and 10 milligram doses of tofacitinib uh, for treatment of psoriatic arthritis. In addition, there were a number of other key endpoints that we measure in psoriatic arthritis uh, that also showed uh, statistical significantly improved results. Uh, and I would add to that that a special feature of the Opal Broaden study uh, was that there was a, uh, a comparative control arm in the study besides placebo, and that was uh, an adalimumab arm. Uh, and what was shown was similar efficacy uh, with adalimumab in um, uh, all of these uh, uh, key efficacy domains. And this is what led to the overall um, uh, positive approval, I feel, because the, the data was pretty straightforward. It was. I think that, in fact, the presentations flowed really well, and uh, the proceeding was uh, relatively short compared to other FDA hearings. There was, however, a lot of discussion about the x-ray data. The manufacturer mentioned that they did an x-ray study, um, not in a traditional way. They largely did an x-ray study to show that x-rays weren't getting worse in people who, in fact, were improving. So uh, the data was presented, analyzed by both the company and the FDA, and, and there was a bit of, cons uh, of discussion about whether this will end up in the label or would be an indication. What's your take on the x-ray data that was presented? So it's an important question and a good one. Uh, yes, uh, x-rays were obtained in one of the studies, uh, the BioNaive or Opal Broaden study. Uh, and this was uh, done more or less as a safety analysis. They wanted to be sure uh, that there was not clear progression of uh, x-ray damage in a patient group, especially the majority of whom were uh, getting better from a clinical perspective. Uh, and so it wasn't designed uh, in terms of either the study design or powering uh, to really uh, 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 look for clear-cut evidence of inhibition of, of progressive x-ray damage. What was, uh, I think, reassuring and will be reassuring to physicians is to know that the data compared to adalimumab was very similar. That is, there was virtually no progression in any of the groups when the x-rays were measured at 12 months. So they were measured at baseline and then again in 12 months. The placebo arm received three months of tofacitinib and then nine months uh, of, uh, I'm sorry, three months of placebo and then nine months of tofacitinib uh, before x-ray at 12 months was obtained. The adalimumab arm was throughout and the two tofacitinib arms, all of them uh, had very similar, similar non-progression rates. So I think that this is re reassuring. Whether or not any of this information gets into the label will be up to the FDA because they, as you know, are going through their deliberations, uh, um, which will include 
uh, the discussions at the advisory committee, but also their overall impression about the data to see whether or not anything gets in the label. So the other side of the coin here is safety. And there was a, a good amount of safety data presented. It was, to me as a viewer, very reassuring. It looked a lot like what we've seen in RA. So uh, with all the safety data that was laid out for the 784 patients that were treated with tofacitinib and psoriatic arthritis, it looked a lot like the RA trials. How, what is this going to mean to the, the, the practitioner who's going, who may use this in psoriatic arthritis? Uh, as you alluded uh, to, Jack, I think it's going to be reassuring because this is the safety profile that is known to rheumatologists. They've been using tofacitinib for years in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. There was nothing new or different uh, in the PSA uh, program. Uh, the, the safety analysis was based on not only the PSA patient population, but also the totality of evidence from the whole rheumatoid arthritis um, uh, database, the post-marketing data, uh, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So the key points were that, yes, there are clear safety signals that we need to be telling our patients about and monitoring for, and that includes serious infection, including uh, herpes zoster uh, reactivation or shingles. Uh, there is, we have to be careful and monitor for malignancy. Uh, there are a number of different laboratory abnormalities that we have to monitor for, hematologic, uh, lipids, um, LFTs, uh, for example. Very, very similar results seen in the PSA population as seen in the rheumatoid arthritis population, uh, which I think is the most comparable for us. Uh, keep in mind, um, however, that uh, since psoriatic arthritis patients usually don't use steroids concomitantly, and sometimes um, uh, other factors, uh, the, uh, there may be a, a slight difference in the patient in front of you with psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid arthritis, but the overall profile is very similar to RA. So the voting on this was near unanimous, and when this committee votes, it's advisory to the FDA, has, and as you said, they have to deliberate on what this will mean when, they, and when and if they might approve the drug. But assuming that this is a positive step and that there will be FDA approval for tofacitinib and psoriatic arthritis, what, if anything, does this say about the use of TOFA in the treatment of psoriasis? Well, if, if uh, the FDA decides to approve the drug, then it will be another drug uh, in our armamentarium. And as you know, we have a number of drugs that are currently very helpful for treating psoriatic arthritis. The various TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, uh, the uh, PDE4 inhibitor, uh, IL-1223 inhibitor. So there's quite, there's quite an array of good uh, and effective drugs. But we know from experience that there tends to be a waning of effectiveness uh, of drugs when we, when we use them. Uh, some data that was, we presented at the meeting was the fact that from a NORDMARD uh, registry uh, that the survival, a typical survival of the first TNF, for example, was about two years uh, before you need to end up moving on because of lack of efficacy or adverse effects. So th I think that it's important for us to have additional drugs, uh, additional mechanism of action, uh, because every psoriatic arthritis uh, patient is not the same as another. And so we need to have options. And the fact that this is an oral medication uh, is I think also a boon because uh, most of the medications, as you know, are parentally applied. So this will just give rheumatologists a broader option. Well, you mentioned a number of uh, options we do have right now for psoriatic arthritis. There's five TNF inhibitors and ultimately they're biosimilars. There's abatacept, there's going to be a few um, um, small molecule inhibitors and IL-17 inhibitors, two or three of those. Do we need another drug to treat psoriatic arthritis? So I come back to the point that I think, yes, I think it's, a, it's good to have further options, either because of the fact that patients may try any one of these that you mentioned, including uh, I, the recently approved abatacept in, in addition to all the others that I previously mentioned, uh, and the, the fact that there may be loss of efficacy over time, so we need new options. 
patient preferences in terms of whether a drug is given orally or subcutaneously or intravenously, uh, and also uh, the knowledge that there are all these different domains, clinical domains in psoriatic arthritis, arthritis, um, uh, enthesitis, dactylitis, et cetera. So I think that it, having this uh, uh, very varied smorgasbord of options is very appropriate for us. Well, Philip, thank you very much for contributing to this therapeutic update. You spoke about domains in your opening lecture at the hearing. You mentioned it here. Those of you who are interested in psoriatic arthritis or a big fan of Philip Meese, you should go to the FDA in a month or two to look at his presentation and the materials he presented. It really was astounding. And we'll put that tweet up on Room now when it happens. Philip, have a great day. Thanks, Jack. <laughs>